Good morning, my lovelies. How are you? Okay, as you can see, this is something we've been waiting for, right? So welcome back to a new episode of Evil Lives Here. Applause. Yes, whatever. Um, it's been way too long. I mean, in all seriousness, it's been way too long since I've done one of these. If you've been with me for a while, you know that um, I had a medical situation and that really just disrupted my life completely. And it lasted for over a year. And during this time, I had gotten into doing these um, episodes and my mental health was not, not good. And you know, watching and reading and talking about some of the worst people um, out there wasn't any better for my med or my mental health. So I had to stop back. I mean, I had to step back. I mean, watching things and talking about things that just emphasize the worst part of people um, really wasn't, wasn't good for me. So I quit doing them and I had promised you guys I'd be back and I kept striving forward mm -hmm. to do this. And I am um, working to slowly get back here and uh, do these on a regular. But, you know, I have to start somewhere, right? And I'm glad to say that things are so much better in my life. Um, they've been good for the past few months. So it's been a couple months since I had a fix and had my surgery and um, have been learning how to live again. Um with my new restrictions and new uh, way of life. So I'm at this point now that once I started thinking about doing these and it just wouldn't leave my head, I knew, I knew, I just knew it was time to get back here. So I'm ready to get back, I'm ready to get going, I'm ready to try this. So let me introduce myself for those of you that are new and you're like, who is this? What is she talking about? Yada, yada, yada. My name is Erin, and this is Ageless Beauty with Erin. Now, this is a beauty page. I do videos of make with makeup. Now, um, after I quit doing the Evil Lives Here in my cult series, it was all makeup relation related. Before that, it was makeup with everything else. But this is a makeup page. I typically do videos with makeup. Everything I do, I'm doing makeup somehow, right? And it's either a new look, trying a new product, um, I do a haul. I do hauls. You know, I buy things from places like Sheen and Timu and then show you. Um, I talk tattoos. We do, we get tattoos together. We discuss that because I have a uh, affiliate code for a tattoo uh, product line that I use a lot and I love. So I like to share with you, um, but I'm kind of an equal opportunity gal. I enjoy doing it all and I really enjoy, and that kind of sounds bad. I really enjoy true, true crime. I'm fascinated by true crime. Enjoying it is really not the correct way that I want to say I like this. Um, but there's been some confusion for some reason. And I just want to state, going into this, you watch my episodes, I will be doing makeup as we discuss the episode, okay? Just want to make sure everybody understands that, that we're all on the same page. During these episodes, I don't talk about the makeup, okay? I do that in my other Get Ready With Me videos. Um, we discuss makeup, we discuss new products, weight, new looks, whatever. Here, I'm just doing it as we discuss because... I simply just like to do makeup and I like to sit and talk to you and what better way to do it as together. Okay, so I get it. As long as you understand that that's what I'm doing, we're good. Kosher. And I understand that not everybody's going to agree with my opinion or um, like my makeup or whatever. You know, I am watching this episode, and I'm just talking about it as I see it. I have no prior knowledge of this episode, of what's going on, until I watch it. And then I write down and keep my reactions 
to talk to you about. I'm always going to be going to try to be respectful. Okay. Um, the dis episodes I'm watching are truly awful for many people that are involved. And whether you're a victim of the actual crime or if you're a victim because you're related. I mean, there's just so many different scenarios. And I try to be respectful for all of those scenarios because I personally, I'm not involved. I was not there. I can, in the back of my head, say I would totally 100% not do what that person did or I would have done this different. But I'm not there. I'm not there in that situation, in that moment, having to make these decisions. So I will always try to be respectful. I may say... I wouldn't have done that or not understanding why something was done, but I don't live in the moment and I don't know what I would do. So that being said, I will try to be respectful to the situation that I'm talking about. I just ask that you be respectful to me as I'm talking about it. And then we're all, we all win. 100% everybody wins. Yay. Hands up. Let's go. So that being said, let's begin. And please, please, please bear with me. I am out of practice. Um, it has been a year since I've done one of these videos and um, I'm just trying to get back into the rhythm of having a script, my notes of what I wrote over here. So if you see me glancing over, it's because it's my notes and um, <clears throat> talking to you while doing makeup. So um, be, bear with me. When I had to quit this, I was in a really good place. I had this bam, 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 down, pat, and I'm not there. And I honestly, I should have watched some of the videos that I did to try to figure out how I did it, but I didn't. So we're going to start all over to see if I can't find my own rhythm. Um, but I will be doing makeup with my mirror right here um, and my notes and you and everything's good. So if you've been around and you've been watching me, you've been following me, you comment, you message, any of those guys, you do not know how much I mean that means to me. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, for anybody that's new, welcome. I hope you enjoy this. Make yourself comfortable and let's get to the topic. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe button, and leave me a message. I'd love to hear from you. You can private message me. You can leave a comment. It don't matter. I love it all. So I'm going to work on getting back to these full time and trying to establish another pattern. I want to say, as always, everything that I am using will be listed down below in the comment section. And, uh, sorry. And, um, if you have any questions about anything I've used, let me know. Like I said, I love talking makeup as much as I love talking true crime. So, um, I got everything ready or thought I did and I forgot something. So, give me a moment. I'll be right back. All right. Let's get to it. So, today's Evil, Liv Evil Lives Here is Season 3, Episode 6. Seasons 1 through 3, Episode 5 are already on my channel. Please don't hesitate to watch it and let me know what you think. Okay, so the title of this episode is First Love Forever Evil. And uh, we start with Melissa, who we find out is the wife. Um, she's the one that's going to be talking to us and kind of leading us through this episode, right? And um, sometimes in the past they bring in other people that are involved, whether it be another family member, children, sometimes even cops. I mean, they do a really good job of getting many people's perspective. This time, though, it is only Melissa. And um, it starts, the actual show starts with a news report. There's shows live footage of um, a police officer talking about... Um, our police officer announcing that 30-year-old Dean Overstreet had been arrested. So, I mean, at this point, we don't know anything else. Okay, 
and that's typically how these episodes start. They like to start, kind of give you a build up, give you a teaser, and then go into the story. So we start here, and they do a lot of this um, with live broadcasts, which I enjoy. But, um, so we know Dean Overstreet has been arrested, but we don't know why. So then Melissa will talk us through the story to lead up to how and when and where all that happened, hopefully. So, um, okay. Melissa starts talking about how her and Dean got together and how <clears throat> about him as the man she fell in love with. So, um, where's it at? Where am I saying? She also, and I believe this is very typical, a survivor guilt or, um, you know, something like that. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a doctor of any kind. But I do see these a lot in the true crime world. People are like, I could have stopped it. I could have made it better. How did I not see it? I feel so guilty. And that's usually coming from the survivor or the someone that lived through it that I won't say is necessarily complicit to the crime. But um, afterwards says, I should have seen it. We all know that that's not how life works. We know that um, many times there's a lot of things in life that we don't know, we don't see, but it's um, a lot of things we don't know, we don't see. It's right in front of our face, right? But I do believe this is kind of a normal response for people, and um, I don't know. It's it, it, it happens often. So, anyways, Melissa is telling us that when she was 13, um, well, when she was 13, and about all her insecurities. So she was a um, very insecure person. Now, at first I was kind of confused what this had to do with anything. Because, I mean, insecurities are a, just no, lo no laughing matter. They are very serious people. I have a ton of insecurities myself. I'm probably one of the most insecure people you will notice about certain things. But I didn't know how her insecurities about her herself, how it would make a difference in the story. But then you figure it out. You find out. And she talks about um, these insecurities and how they led her to Dean and the situation she was in and why she did the things she did. So, yeah. After really getting into it, I'm like, okay, that's why. That part of the situ or the story that they're telling is important. That's that's why. So we uh, okay. Where am I? At? Uh, she was in junior high, and a lot of people, younger people, do not know what a junior high is. They never had one. I personally graduated um, as the last class in the junior high. No. Was that the last class graduated? No, it was the first class that graduated when it was turned from a junior high to a middle school. So, um, yeah, this is something that a lot of people are not aware of. But a junior high typically is what we would consider now the middle school. But junior high, you, at that time, in my experience, she doesn't talk about this per se. But I find it funny because a lot of people do not understand what a junior high is. But a junior high, in my experience, was um, grade 7 and 8. When they brought in the middle school, that's when they brought in grade 6. Okay? I'm just going by my own, um, <clears throat> what, you know, what I went through. That That's probably close to what it was for her. So, I don't know. That, that's not important. I just found it funny that a lot of people don't know what a junior high is anymore. And then I realized I'm old. What can I say? Okay, so she was being bullied. Back to the story. Back to the important part. Um, she was being bullied by a couple of girls. And um, I hate that because it just seems like it is such a... Bullying is never okay. Ever. Okay. And those of us that have been bullied and lived through it, um, 
know that it's not okay. But it happens. It happens way more than any of us care to admit. Any more than um, should be ever allowed. So <clears throat> she talks about bullying. And um, she was afraid to tell anyone in school because she thought it would actually make it worse. And um, she want, wanted to find a way to make her situation better. How could she get out of being bullied? And ultimately, that was her goal. That was her purpose in life. How can she... Stop being bullied. And then she tells us that the first time she saw Dean and how she thought he was really cute. And she said, you know, he had that puppy dog look to him. And I think all, most of us girls in middle school loved those little guys that had that puppy dog look that needed someone to help them or um, rescue them or lead them or I don't know. I mean, come on. Middle school girls are not the smartest. I was one, I know. And um, so I kind of get what she was saying. He had that puppy dog look and she needed to feel needed. She needed to feel like she was wanted. And Yeah. So, um, <laughs> okay. She states that she was, and I quote, looking for protection, and people knew you didn't mess with an overstreet girl, end quote. So she thought Dean was cute. She thought, you know, he had these puppy dog eyes. But I think overall she thought he would be a good way for her to have some protection. I think truly when she went into this, that was her go. So she she said the overstreets, everybody knew they would fight anybody, anywhere, anytime. They didn't care and um, end of story. If you were uh, considered one of their girls, you were protected beyond measure. So that's what she wanted, right? That's what she needed. And um, she said that even though she was really shy in school, like I said, insecurity, she's being bullied. Of course she's shy. Um, she actually decided to approach him. And she did. She walked up to him. And I, you know, I've got to assume she didn't just walk up to him one day and say, hey, you don't know me, but you want to go with me? And that used to be the saying when we were in school, do you want to go with me? And that's what she did. So I don't know, you know, if they were friends or whatever leading up to it, but she said that she approached him and asked him if he wanted to go with her. Again, I'm showing my age because I completely understood what she was saying. But, um, basically, it is, um, do you want to be my boyfriend? And apparently he said yes. So um, <laughs> that's how it all started. That's how it all got together. And um, yeah, one bad situation that she was in led her to another bad situation that she was going to get in. Now, is that her fault? No. I mean, none of us can see the future. We Nobody at that moment could have said, don't do that. You don't know. No, life doesn't work that way. However, that is what happened. So they started dating. And I was also confused here because she talks about the start of the story. She was 13 when all this happened. So I doesn't give ages after that. I mean, was she still 13 when she started dating this guy? Um, uh, it doesn't really state. I know they date... Um, for a while, actually, 
all through high school until, you know, further, but I don't know if they actually got together when she was 13 or if that's just when the story started for her. And that being that um, she was being bullied and needed somebody to protect her. Anyways. Uh, she did get her protection when she started dating him. She said everybody left her alone. You know? Said she felt a freedom she had had in a while. Nobody bothered her. She was Dean's girl. Everybody knew that. They walked down the hallway and held hands or, you know, whatever possessive ways that you show that you're going out with somebody holding hands, you're kissing them in the hallway, you're, you know, writing, um, Melissa loves Dean on your, sh I mean, it, there's, come on, we've all been there, we were all dumb and young and did things like that, so, <clears throat> Everybody knew she was Dean's girl, so nobody bothered her. And it says about two or three months in, Melissa realized there was a cost for that protection. And of course, you know, of course there is. We're not going to be here if there wasn't, right? Um. Anyways, so he uh, started getting very possessive. Very, very possessive. And... Um, it started pretty typical, I think, for this kind of a situation. Um, he would tell her what he could and could not wear. She used to like to dress cute and wear um, little dresses and skirts or whatever and put on makeup. And he flat out told her she didn't need to do that anymore. She had him. She doesn't need to be cute for anybody else and try to draw attention to herself. And... Um, He wanted her in jeans and a t-shirt. That's all she needed to be in. No need to be cute. No need to be yourself. You do this. And, uh... She stopped. She stopped wearing her cute little outfits. And the cute little outfits that she loved. And she stopped wearing makeup. I <laughs> know. That's not, like, the most serious part of the story. I just thought it was funny. Here I am doing makeup talking about this. And she's like, nope, I had to give up all my cute little clothes and everything that I loved because he said I didn't need it anymore. And she did. So, um, she states that no one had ever treated her as good as Dean did. You know, he showed her and told her every day that he loved her. I mean, she, she was pretty starved for that attention and she felt treasured she felt pretty she felt like she was enough when she was with him she says that her parents were really good people she said she knew her parents loved her and she loved them they were not affectionate they did not tell i don't know how many siblings that she had but she said she did not tell them or they did not tell them that they loved them or you know showed any excess to way to verbalize or express that they loved their children. So she was very deprived and needed that attention. And that goes along with the other insecurity she had. I mean, obviously it doesn't help if you already are insecure about yourself and your weight and the way you look, thinking you're not pretty or, you know, a hundred other things that she said in the beginning. And but your parents also don't help. And, uh, tell you they love you or I can't imagine not telling my children I love them like I tell my kids I love them every day and I my daughter I uh, I don't necessarily tell my son that I think he's cute or looks good or you know if he's handsome if he's wearing something really nice and I have to tell him he looks very nice and you know whatever but my daughter she she does herself up or whatever I make sure to tell her that she's gorgeous and I think she's very pretty and blah 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 and she does something different to her hair I can't imagine being a parent and not doing that, you know? And that's fine. I know there are parents that are. I, I really do. I know there are parents that do not verbalize or whatever, and it doesn't mean they don't love their children. It, it just might not be their love language. And, again, 
get it. Um, I don't get it, but I see where it's coming from. And apparently Melissa's family was that way. It wasn't that they didn't love them. They didn't verbalize it or express it. So, um, yeah, just a little different um, way of living, I guess. So, she said, Melissa says that Dean filled that spot in her heart, in her mind, that she had open because of those insecurities and doubts. Again, like I said, at first I wasn't sure why she was telling us about her insecurities. And then the more it got going, I'm like, I get it. I mean, this is why she was such easy... I don't know if pray be the right word, but it makes that why she was um, easily fell for Dean. Now, it should be no surprise. To anyone that I'm going to go off camera and do these lashes because I can't talk and do this at the same time. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back and sorry about that. If you ever want to watch me put my lashes on and see my um, process, hit one of my other Get Ready With Me videos because I do my lashes on there all the time. Talk about lashes, show you other options, whatever. But it's hard for me to talk and do this story while I am trying to put on lashes. So, hence, you know, it's not even the lashes, it's the eyeliner, the precision you need to put on eyeliner. So, anyway, I am ready. I am back. And, as I was saying... Dean had just gotten to the point where he was now controlling what Melissa could and could not wear. It is really no surprise to anybody, or it shouldn't be, that he got more demanding and telling her more and more what she could and could not do. Okay? So, that's where we're going to pick up at. Um, he starts telling her that she, who she could and couldn't hang out with. He, she couldn't hang out with her friends. And... Or go places with her friends because he should be the only person that she, he she wants to hang out with. She doesn't need anybody else. She has him. Okay. And um, so he gave her these set of rules, right? What to wear, who she could be friends with, how to act, and told her, quote, those were the rules, end quote. So she wants to date him. These are the rules she has to abide by. So, um, and she was petrified that he would leave her. And that's just basically what it was. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. She did everything he told her to. She gave up friends. <coughs> Um, she gave up friends. She quit hanging out with people. Um, she just agreed to do everything. She did not want to lose him. She did not, um, want to lose that sense of security that she had. And, you know, again, he was so possessive and made sure that she followed these rules. So not only is he... Telling, oh, I just sprayed that right in my eye. There it is. I couldn't feel it. I thought I had it right, but I must not have. Anyways, he started having friends or people. I don't even know if they were his friends or if they were just scared of him and did what he wanted. But he started having her watched. And it would be in class or out of class or whatever. And these people that were watching her in every class were reporting back to Dean. <clears throat> and they would tell him everything. Who she spoke to, what she did, what... You know, if she wasn't with Dean, he still wanted to know every move she made. So, if it was something that he didn't like... If she spoke to somebody he didn't like or, um, I don't know, just anything, he would confront her about it and there would be an argument. And, uh, he 
he would lay down after the argument, which of course he always won, there would be more rules. She no longer was allowed to speak to said person that he didn't like. So she tells the story of one time this guy in class was selling posters that he had made for a band he was in. And she said, you know, it wasn't like they were expensive or anything. So she said she wanted to support him and she bought a poster. Oh my gosh. <sighs> Dean found out. Right? And was so mad. And this is where it got a little confusing to me because he didn't necessarily blame Melissa. He blamed the guy that had the posters that she bought. And he kept saying that, you know, he was going to take care of it. He was going to take care of it. He was going to take care of it. And, you know, Melissa's like, it's okay. There's nothing to take care of. He was selling a poster. I bought it. Yada, yada, yada. And, of course, they didn't say yada, yada, yada. That's my own take of it. But anyways, he said the next day, Dean came into school with a gun. And he kept telling her he was going to take care of the problem. And, of course, she fought with him. She's like, this is not right. You should not bring that gun to school. And, of course, his whole thing was, no, it was not right. He shouldn't have bothered you. He shouldn't have asked you to buy that uh, poster. Well... It, it scared Melissa. And she did the right thing. She went in and told her teacher that he had a gun. And the te they went in and um, called the cops. The cops came and he was arrested. So, I mean, she did the right thing. Right? I don't know if anybody else, any of us would say that wasn't the right thing to do. He was taken to jail and eventually released to his parents' custody and put on probation. He did, however, and she doesn't state how. I guess it really doesn't matter. But he found out she's the one that towed on him. Okay? good for Melissa, right? Anyways, um, Dean confronted her, obviously, and told her he was disappointed in her. And he pulled that whole, I thought you knew me better than that card, and um, how could you think I would do this? Yada, yada, yada. And she then says she felt guilty. And I quote, she was hurt that she had disappointed him, end quote. And she, she apologized. It might be too loud, but I'm a little hot, so I'm going to just dry my face off. She apologized and convinced him that she did trust him. That she was just scared at the moment because he brought that to school. She said at this moment in their relationship, she had friends telling her that she needed to uh, get out. That he was dangerous and um, it scared them. However, she was loved or she felt loved. She loved him at this point and um, protected. She wasn't going to lose that. She was not going to get rid of that feeling of being loved and cherished and protected. So... She stayed. And eventually, they got married. She, again, doesn't tell us how old they were when they got married. It really doesn't tell us anything other than um, they got married. And uh, I wish I knew. I said the, at the point, it starts it with her being 13, but it doesn't tell us anything else age-wise throughout the whole story until... We know how old he was when he was arrested. And I have to wonder, I never did find out, and I, I think about it, at least that I can remember, if he was older than her or not. 
like I said, it made it sound like they were both in middle school when they started dating. So he would be at least her age, if not a year older. And, um, unless he had been held back or some other circumstances I'm not aware of. But, um, yeah, I don't know how old they were when they got married, but, um, she said that all her dreams were coming true. She was so happy. This was everything she had always wanted. She wanted to be a housewife. She wanted to be a mother. And she really thought that he was her one and only. Like, she thought there was nobody else, that there was be nobody else. And um, she was ecstatic. She was happy. But she said her fairy tale didn't come true. Nothing went as planned. And at that point, I went, well... You are on a show called Evil Lives Here. We kind of knew that. Sorry. Okay. I'm going to do my eyebrows again off camera because I can't talk and do this at the same time. If you want to see how I do my eyebrows, check one of my other videos. Okay. Now. So, she talks about in their marriage, Dean had become obsessed with weaponry. And I gotta think, he probably already had a nice little selection or um, obsession with weapons. I mean, he took a gun to school, right? She says he was really obsessed with knives. And every day he would lay them out, he'd clean them, he would do, you know, whatever it is you do with knives, because I'm not familiar with knives. But um, he always had one or more on his person at any given time. They were his pride and joy. She said her his, his obsession worried her because of his volatile temper. So, yeah, apparently. <laughs> wasn't really surprised when she said this, but she says he had become violent with her. And, um... She never says he actually hits her. But the one point, the first time she talks about him being violent, they get into an argument over something. And I don't even think she really tells us what it is. But he slams her up against the wall and puts the knife to her throat. And when she instinctively pulls her hand up to protect herself, he slices her hand. Okay? You with me so far? Well, um, sorry. I'm thinking 20 things at once. So she runs to the bathroom because she's bleeding to clean it up. And, of course, he goes with her and uh, starts at, oh, I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't, you know, whatever. And I'm like, how did you not mean to do that? You pulled the knife. Nobody forced you to pull a knife. You pulled a knife and put it up to her throat. You meant to do something. But it ended up cutting her, and um, she says, and I quote, Dean putting the knife to my throat was enough for me to think I probably should leave, but not enough for me to actually do it, end quote. I'm just going to leave that there for a minute. Just, just going to leave that right there. I have nothing. So, um, she said she told him that if he kept doing things like that, she would leave. But then, in the same breath, she says, I didn't really want to leave. I just wanted him to stop. So, again, I'm, I'm not going to touch that. But it did make me wonder, was this actually the first time he did it to her? Because, honestly, it doesn't sound like it was. The way she's saying, if you keep doing it, and whatever. And then she was talking earlier, too, that his volatile temper worried her with the knives. So, I'm thinking there was a lot more to their relationship that she hadn't told us. And that's okay. I'm just stating what I'm seeing. So, 
Now we're at the part where Melissa talks about them starting a family. Okay. And uh, I'm going to move some stuff out of the way. I'm not going to move it far. I was going to, but I'm not going to move it far. Anyways, so... Um, she said things really seemed to get better after having a family. She says that Dean just loved their kids to pieces. And holidays were always a great time. Um, he just loves, he loved the holidays. He loved the family at the holidays, blah, blah, blah. And she finally felt like she got the um, fairy tale ending that she had always wanted. Crap. So, um, she mentions at one time that she was showing a picture and she says that's her and Dean with three of our kids. So I'm like, how many kids did they have? Cause it never specifies. And, uh, I just decided at that moment, cause it wasn't something I looked up, um, originally. Like I, I try to respect the young ones in the family, their privacy and, ability to not be judged because of who their parents are. So I looked it up though. I was curious how many kids and uh, Melissa and Dean had three girls and one boy. So there was four total. Three of them were in that picture that drew my attention when she said oh, three of their kids. Um, quick article I read. Also, I wanted to mention this and I'm sorry, I'm kicking the table here that after all the uh, events went down. So after everything was said and done and um, Dean was arrested, Melissa, um, where's his name? Okay, Melissa took the kids and moved away and she tried to change the kid's last name from Overstreet to her maiden name, which they did say what it was because they introduced her at that. I didn't write it down. I honestly don't remember. It started with an H. That's all I do remember. It's not important. Um, but, and this is what I completely didn't understand. Because she had every right to change these kids' names so that they are not completely judged by being uh, a murderer's children. Right? And it was denied. They, they wouldn't let her change the names. What was it? It said, the judge wouldn't let him saying that Dean had a right to object to this change. So, I don't know. Like I said, I know Melissa was using her maiden name, and I will discuss that at the end because I did find out more about that. But I don't know if the kids were eventually able to change their name. I really hope that she was able to get that done for them because nobody should have to live... Uh, as a known killer's child, I mean, just should not be. But I guess, even in jail, he had rights to control those kids. That, that blew me away. I'm sorry, that really did. They were the innocent. They were innocent. They weren't the innocent. They were innocent in all of this and should not have to live. So I really hope... I did not check further, and I will explain why later. I mentioned it a little bit, but I believe they are victims as well and should be let to live their life. Anyways, back to the story. Um, Melissa then starts talking about Dean being in construction and how he would jump from job to job as the employment was sporadic and just trying to find something that was available. You know... I know for a fact this life is hard. I was raised, uh, my stepfather was a brick mason, and um, that work is very, very sporadic, very um, seasonal. I get the hard times that they went through. I do. I mean, I won't go into it, but completely understand those times that they are talking about. And, um... Melissa said that he would get up early morning 
and not come home until late, late at night or sometimes the next morning. And he was out looking for jobs. And uh, whenever she would question, you know, where you been or whatever, he would come at, back with the whole, um, it was nothing to worry about. It was none of your business. My, um, what was it? it? It's my business. You need to stay out of it. Both of those are quotes from Melissa that he would tell her when she would ask where he had been. And I do have a problem with that because um, <laughs> if my significant other or my child, anybody that was doing something I found kind of odd and when asked, that was their answer. Yeah, I would highly think that there was something that I do need to worry about. That there was something that, um, hmm, doesn't feel quite right here, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, don't know what I would have done in that situation again. But I do know that that would have raised some um, red flags to me. But uh, that's just me. So one night, he comes home and he's in a panic. And he's home earlier than usual, apparently, because Melissa's still up kind of waiting for him. She said she did that. She would wait for him till a certain time, and then she would go to bed. The kids would be in bed, whatever. But he come home, and the, I think even the kids were still up. And he comes in and he starts barricading the house up, closing all the windows, locking all the doors and windows, and um, just totally paranoid, right? And he tells her to get the kids upstairs, stay away from the windows, whatever. But he wouldn't ever tell her really what was going on. And she's like, I thought he was having a paranoid delusion. And apparently he had suffered from this before that she hadn't brought up till now. But, so she really, she didn't say much more than that. She thought she, he was having a paranoid delusion. But after that, all the doors had to stay locked. Um, windows had to stay shut and locked. Curtains can't be open. You know, he was really isolating all of them. And um, his delusions, as she called them, just kept getting worse and worse. I'm going to be done with my makeup first. I did not time this out really well. But that's okay. We'll talk. And, uh. It was so confusing because she said that when he wasn't in the house, he had a little shed that he would lock himself in and stay out there for hours. And um, she was never allowed in it. She was never allowed to go close, to whatever. And that's literally all they said about the shed. And I'm like, hmm? Is there more to this story? But apparently he was delusional, he was paranoid, and he wouldn't let the family open up the house, windows, whatever, and he spent all his time in a shed that he had out back, I guess. It doesn't even tell us where the shed's at, but I'm going to assume it's out back. Aren't most sheds out back? And, um, yeah, I literally, even when I did some deep diving research, and I say deep diving like I actually... Pulled out my detective cap and I didn't. But um, it's never mentioned anything about that shit ever again. So this whole part of her story that I'm talking about now was very confusing to me because she it's never clarified anything about any of this. So I'll tell you what I'm talking about. So uh, she eventually confronted him, right? And... Um, Want to know what was going on? What was in the shed? Why was he coming home late? Why couldn't she open the windows? And um, the kids couldn't go outside. You know, she confronted him. And Dean, Dean, blah, 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 Dean finally tells her that 
I have to read this part because it's so much. It's just weird. So he finally tells her that what he, that what he is doing is to keep everyone safe. I'm sorry. I don't want to let that just sit like that. So, and he didn't want to get her involved in it. He was protecting her along with the kids and the whole world. And, but he has been killing people as a vigilante. So, there's some guy paying him to do it too. That, um, Dean said that all the guys he killed had it coming. Or, I don't know. All the people he killed. He never said it was just guys. But they had it coming. And um, Dean and this mysterious guy were not going to let them get away with their crimes. So whatever they did, they were not punished for. And since justice hadn't been served, he was holding, he was handing out that justice. But he was also being watched by the people that were hiring him. And being followed. He, if he did anything out of line, they would take his family out to keep the situation under control and to keep the network safe. However, he wouldn't or couldn't tell her who they were. And, um, quite frankly, nothing else is ever said about this. So, Melissa says that she didn't really believe him. She said she was in shock, obviously. Someone's saying they're being a vigilante and giving you this really crazy story. It, it, it's a crazy story. So you're in shock and you're listening to it, but you don't quite believe it. And Melissa said that was her. She said she didn't quite believe what he was saying. She thought his paralyzed paranoid delusions um, had just gotten the best of him and she was just hoping it all go away. Just, yep. All of it would just go away and she can have her happy family back because it was just too much to think about, I guess. I, I really don't know. But um, we know that if you ignore things, it doesn't necessarily get better. And it didn't. So one day she, well, Dean continued to get worse. And then one day when she decided she had enough of the house being dark and stuffy and the kids needed some fresh air, she decided to open the windows and curtains. And it caused a huge argument between her and Dean, who at that point, he attacked her, shoved up against the wall and put a gun to her head. So he's now not only having knives, he has guns on him. And he tells her, you know, he should just kill her himself so he doesn't have to worry about the network coming after them or the others doing it for him. He could just do it, take out, take her out and not worry about it anymore. And proceeded to shoot the wall right next to her head just to prove that he could do it. I'm going to tell you what, she probably couldn't hear for days. I mean, there's no other way to say that. She was probably um, deaf for days. But it was enough for her to um, leave. She said she took the kids, she left, went to her parents' house, and filed for divorce the next day. Now, this part of the story just grinds my gears. <laughs> Trying to be nice. Um, so she didn't say how long she was gone, but she had filed for divorce quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she wanted self custody because she was terrified of what he would do to the kids. Right? I mean, I wasn't there. I'm terrified for what he would do to the kids. <clears throat> so I'm sorry. <clears throat> can't quite clear my throat there. Um, We're going to attempt to put on eyeliner and everything oh. while talking. But, um, 
So she wanted sole custody for the kids or Dean to have supervised custody or supervised visitations. I'm sorry. And, um, however, because she had never worked and, um, had no proof because she had never filed anything that he was actually dangerous or would hurt the kids. She would only get joint custody if they divorced. And she talks about it. You know, she says she kept telling them what was she supposed to do? What was she supposed to do? But, you know, they kept telling her she had no case. There was no proof that he would hurt those kids. And I just, oh, it upsets me so much. The fact that in many cases, you actually have to be hurt to prove that someone's going to hurt you. Anyways, she couldn't do that. She could not give, let him have those kids without her being there. So she went back to him. Begged for his forgiveness. And got back together with him. And, um, yeah, she did it for the kids. She could not, in good faith, let those kids stay with him. You know, I get it. I do. You do anything you can for your kids, right? So, um, she said after she went back, she and the kids walked on eggshells. She said, all the time, everything that they did, she was terrified. She even slept in the same room as the kids. She wouldn't even let them out of their sight. She was to protect them. But she said, I was a prisoner in my own home. She said, they were scared of him and what he would do. Oh, I got something in my eye. All right, hopefully I got it. Um, so she says one night she was home alone with the kids. Dean was out doing Dean stuff and his brother. So they've never really mentioned the Overstreet brothers, but they, you know, you knew there was a big family. You knew they all were rough and tough people, whatever. But she talks about Scott, the brother. He shows up at the house one night and he proceeds to tell her that Dean is at the shooting range and wants her to go pick him up. Now, a couple things. She said, I was curious why. And she said, and I asked Scott why he didn't bring Dean home if he was there with him. Good question. And Scott tells her that Dean wanted her to pick him up. I had a question because she says that she did. She went and picked him up. My question is, who stayed with the kids? Because, I mean, she tells us Dean or Scott went home. So Scott didn't stay with those kids. So at this point... Were the kids old enough to stay by themselves? Is kind of where I'm thinking about that. But it never states. So anyways, um, she says she goes and picks him up and she was terrified that he was going to do something to her. That he was finally trying to get her alone and do something to her. But she still went. And, um... She said when she got there, he had this really crazy look on his face and, um, or in his eyes, I'm sorry. And he wouldn't talk to her. She kept asking him what was wrong, what was going on, blah, blah, blah. And he would not talk to her and eventually told her, what was it, uh, to leave him alone and that she did not want to mess with him. So she did. She said, I didn't ask another question. I took him home. In the story, what said she got home, he completely ignored her and the kids, and he went right to bed. End of story, you know, that's all. I would have been okay, see you later. But she said it was a few days later that's the first time she heard the name Kelly Eckert. And Kelly was a college freshman 
who had disappeared after leaving her part-time job one night. So, it was on the news. And Melissa was watching the news and heard it. And the night she went, dis the night Kelly dis went disappeared, the night Kelly disappeared was the same night that she went and picked up Dean from the shooting range and he was acting funny. And she said, I just had this feeling. I just knew they were connected somehow. And uh, in her heart, she knew that somehow he was involved. I don't, I, I, I'm telling you, there had to be more to the story that we knew. And we find out there was. But for her to immediately, <clears throat> excuse me, jump to the conclusion that he was involved, you've got to think there was something else that we weren't told. And like I said, there is. And we find out when I do a little research. However, we're not there yet. So, she asked him. She asked him, do you know this girl? Have you, you know, ever seen her? Anything like that? And he got all offended. Um, apparently, you know, how could you believe I would do that? Blah, blah, blah. The whole guilt trip thing that he would pull on her and she fell for. Her and, yeah, you know, I don't know if I would say she fell for it this time, but she quit asking questions. But the next day... Dean started one in the newspaper every, every day. And he was following this story really, really closely. Like, it was not really news. Especially when um, her body was found um, on the side of the road. Like, two days later. Something like that. Not too long. But he started watching the news for updates. He was reading the daily paper for anything written about her. And all he was reading and all he was looking for was the stories on Kelly. <clears throat> said that, and Melissa said that that's odd. He never watched the news. He never cared about the newspaper. So for him to start paying attention and just watching the one story drew her attention. That there was something going on. But... Uh, he became obsessed. And then, like I said, Kelly's body was found on the side of the road by someone walking her dog. She was 18 years old. Had been sexually assaulted and strangled with a shoelace and one of her straps from her overall thing. Not quite sure how that worked, but it, in many cases it said her shoelace and the strap from her overalls. <coughs> so, Melissa said that in her heart she knew he had done it. Uh, but had never thought he was actually capable of murdering or killing someone. She didn't know what to do. So she said, you know, she, she had this feeling he did it, but from what she was telling us, nothing that actually could prove it or gave her any indication that he actually had done it. So... She said the police had no leads or suspects, and they were asking the public um, for help, right? So she she said she considered calling the cops. Said she didn't want to, but she kept remembering when uh, Dean found out that she told on him for having a gun in school. So she never said anything. She never did anything. However, apparently, Scott, the brother, had broken down and told a friend of his that he thought Dean had killed Kelly. And because there are still good people in this world, even if it is rare, the friend of the brother called in a tip and told which led to Scott and Kelly. Scott and Melissa, I'm so sorry, being brought in and questioned. And Melissa says she was terrified. She said at first, you know, 
she, she, she was terrified. And eventually she broke down and um, told the police that if she told them anything, Dean would kill her. They had to arrest Dean if she was going to talk. So Dean was arrested. <coughs> and the episode ended. Pretty much Dean was arrested. And Melissa was finally relieved once she was once he was arrested. And then she talks about how her and the kids had a really hard time in the hometown they lived in because they were associated with Dean, who was at first being accused of murder and then proven guilty of murder. And, of course, if you can't get the kids' last names changed at that time, um, they had a hard time. So, that's really how it ended. And we knew that Dean was arrested. He was 30. We don't know much else. So, as I like to do with these stories, I like to take a deeper dive. And, um, let's look into it. So, when I go in and take the deeper look, I end up at a site, I end up in two different sites that really I like. I use them quite often. Um... So, cinemaholics.com is one of the first ones I go to. And there was an article titled, Where is Michael Overstreet Now? So, this gets a little confusing because his name was Michael Dean Overstreet. So, everything I read had him as Michael. And I tried to change it over to Dean because that was how the story was told to us. This article was dated August 2021. So, we learned through this site that... The murder of Kelly Eckert happened in Indiana in 1997. That's the first time I find anything about a date that this had happened and a location, which is, is, is normal. I usually don't find these things out until afterwards when I look into it. Um, and it took a month after they found Kelly's body to um, arrest Dean for the murder. So she, Kelly was a freshman in college. And worked at the local Walmart part-time. And that was where she was on the night of her disappearance. She uh, had been in a relationship with a guy. And they don't really talk about him or his name. But apparently after she got off work, they had spent a little time together. Um, I think at the store. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And then she left the store never to be seen again. So according to her autopsy. Well, no, let me go back. It says Kelly's car was found abandoned two hours after she left work. Keys were still in the ignition. Lights were still on. Her purse was on the front seat, but Kelly was nowhere to be found. So it was very suspicious from the beginning. Um, and according to her autopsy, and this is something that hasn't hadn't been said before, but Kelly had been shot in the head, assaulted, and then strangled. So I'm thinking she was shot in the head. And it must not have been what killed her because... The official cause of death was strangulation. Um, so, damage to Kelly's car indicated that she had been rear-ended. Which is why she ended up pulling over in, you know, middle of nowhere, I guess. So, a month after Kelly's remains were found, the tip from Scott's friend came in. And at which time Scott was questioned. And it said that he had received a call from his brother. So, we're hearing more of the story. More of the truth than what we heard in the episode. I find that interesting. But uh, Scott says, when he was questioned, he said that he had received a call from Dean to come pick him and his girlfriend up at a motel because they had been drinking and couldn't drive. Scott thought it was odd. I mean, he knew he was married, that Dean was married and had kids or whatever. But he went to help his brother. He said once he got there, Dean changed the plans. And apparently it was only Dean. It wasn't him and a girlfriend. It was just Dean. And he wanted to go camping. And Scott questioned why Dean said, and I quote, I took a girl, end quote. So it doesn't give a lot more detail than that. But Scott says he dropped him off and refused to go pick him back up. Like he's like, I'm not wanting anything else involved in this. I'm done. So then Dean told Scott to send Melissa to pick him up. And when Melissa got there, Dean was holding a blanket and a rifle in his arms. 
and instruct and this now comes from Melissa. So Melissa's now telling this story, which was not the same original story that she was saying on the show. So Melissa says when she got there, Dean was holding a blanket and his rifle in his arms and instructed Melissa straight away to lie about where she picked him up from. So she picked him up from some camp, not the rifle shooting range. And then afterwards, they were to take the van to get washed. So the van is what Dean was driving and apparently rear-ended Kelly's car. But um, so that he instructed Melissa to go wash this van, get this van cleaned inside and out. Which, of course, none of it was mentioned in the story that I watched. And um, I think the story that we watched probably was what she originally told the cops. Because she was told to lie. And, quite frankly, Melissa did tell everybody. Or did do what Dean told her to. I'm not blaming Melissa in any sense. At this point, she had been conditioned to the point to do what Dean had told her to do. And Dean told her to lie. So, the story was that she picked him up at the rifle range. Or shooting range, and that's what she did, when in fact, she didn't. However, when Dean was turned in, the investigators found fibers, fibers from that blanket he had, and it matched those fib- some fibers that were found on Kelly's body. Scott also was found with belongings from Kelly that Dean had given him to hide, and the dents in the van, or in his van, Matched the dents in Kelly's car, like I mentioned a minute ago. And to top it all off, case closed, book done. Um, there was sperm found in Kelly that matched Dean. So, I mean, it was a very solid case. Uh, it's just, yeah, Dean was done. So, at this point, we don't know what the verdict is. I will talk about that in a moment. However, it goes on to say that D- Dean did appeal his verdict in 2014. And he was found mentally inca- incompetent. For the sentence that he was that he had received back in was that nineteen ninety seven? I don't know. I'll go on and we'll talk about that. So today he is still in a maximum security Indiana State Prison and is in mid fifties. <clears throat> and in a follow up article on the same site that had to do with Melissa, it talks about how she divorced Dean, took back her maiden name. And testified him against him in court, which is when she told the truth where she picked him up and him having a blanket and all that. She now currently lives away from the spotlight, doing her best to keep her children away from the scrutiny. And this was written the same time in 2021 as the first article. Now, to another site. This is Murderpedia.org. I don't know. I find this, like, quite interesting. It's very basic, like bare bones, but this is point A, B, C, and you find what you want. So, Dean, or Michael Dean Overstreet, was born November 18, 1966. Kelly was his only known victim. And the date of her murder was September 27, 1997. He was sentenced to death 20 years and 20 years consecutive. So, he had death 20 years and then a second 20 years all to be served consecutively. I'm pretty sure that's what that means. Um... So once he's first done with his first 20 years, he has another 20 years to go. Unless, you know, he gets the death penalty first. He was set to be executed on May 30th, <clears throat> 2018. However, and let me check something. because that... huh, He appealed his verdict in 2014. But he was set to be executed in 2008. So there's some conflicting stories on the two sites that I got these from. And I didn't notice it till now. However, he was not executed. The appeal that he had that claimed that he was in... He was not mentally capable of being executed halted his um, execution. Um, so the actual verdict stated he was not mentally competent to be executed... And would remain on death row. He cannot be executed until his mental health improves significantly. I don't see that ever happening. And I don't know. I I really don't know. I mean, do people just get to stay on death row for the rest of their life without? I guess so. I, I really don't know. So, nothing mentions the kids in these stories. And I did do that little bit of brief research before. Um... You know, I found out how many kids they had and so on and so forth. 
I did not look further. These kids deserve their privacy and their um, ability to step away from this tragedy. They really do. They deserve that. So I didn't look any. They were innocent victims themselves, um, and they deserve that. So I didn't look into it any further. I will say, I did not find out a few things that question that I'm very questioned questionable. I okay. Did not find out things that I question a lot, like. Where did Dean go all those nights that he disappeared for hours or all day or whatever? Nothing. What was in that shed? You would think after they arrested him and did the search, they would have mentioned the shed. Nothing. Was he really playing vigilante? Was he out there killing people and it never got solved? Because at no point does it state that he was ever convicted or even considered to kill anybody else. Yet he told his wife he's out there playing vigilante. He's killing people that deserve to be killed. So, you know, there's a lot of questions there. And a lot of it can be answered by his paranoia delusions. So, maybe that's it. But he still had to be going somewhere every night. Even if he thought he was killing somebody, or he thought he was doing this or whatever, that in his mind, he was still leaving the house. Where was he going? Who was he with? That was just a few things I wondered and never got answers on. So, I don't know. This just seems a little weird. However, I want to end this story and I want to bring it back to the victim and the person that deserves the attention. And that's Kelly Eckert. So, I want to end on a few notes. Um, as stated, she was 18-year-old student, freshman at Franklin College, um, it doesn't say what her major was. She might have been undecided. Freshmen typically can go in undecided and typically are undecided. So besides being a full-time student, she did work part-time at Walmart as well. Um, and on September 27th, the day of her death, 1997, Kelly met up with her boyfriend for a short time. So they would have met up at Walmart. They, I think I read they spent about an hour together and then she drove home. And she lived in Shelby County, Indiana. And that was the last time anybody saw her alive, was when she left Walmart to go home. She was born May 3rd, 1979, in Beach Grove, Beach Grove, Indiana. And, uh, yeah, that's really all the information I could find about her. And, um, yeah, I didn't know what her major was. I don't know her family. I know she, I, I'm pretty sure I read that she had a brother and her parents were very upset about the uh, appeal that Dean won for mental incapacitation. But other than that, it really never talked about her family or anything along those, ma along those lines. So, that is this story. That's the end. I made it. I did it. You know, um, thank you for taking the time to watch. I hope it wasn't too painful. Like I said, I'm trying to get back into a groove. And these topic topics can be so heavy. Um that, you know, it takes a little mental toe on you, which is why I think I like doing the makeup when I do them, because it gives me something to think about and concentrate besides this tragic story that I'm telling you. But I did. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, maybe that is the wrong words, but I do hope that you enjoyed the video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this case. Do you have the same questions I do? It just seems like there's a lot that we were not told. Maybe I didn't look in the right places. I don't know. So anyways, I will work to get back on a regular schedule. I'm going to try to still do a couple of Get Ready With Me videos in between there to keep, you know, some kind of flow and, um, yeah, see if I can't get on a regularly scheduled appointment, whatever. But thank you again, and thank you for watching. Let me know what you thought. Don't forget to hit that like and share button. And until next time, guys, love you. Goodbye.